I spent a lot of time growing up in, in parks just like this. I mean, sitting here remind, reminds me of, of baseball games and my first job coaching baseball, umpiring baseball. I spent hours and hours, hundreds of hours in a park just like this growing up. It also reminds me of, of honestly, of time with my dad. Like, I remember my dad teaching me how to, how to throw a ball, uh, how to hit, keep your elbow up, keep your eye on the ball. Huh? I remember as a little kid, I was playing Little League, and, and my dad would, well, he would want to come to the game, but my dad was a busy physician, so it wasn't like he could come to every baseball game I had, and it wasn't just me. There were five boys in my family. So in the mornings during the summer, there was Little League baseball, and there was game after game after game. And the coolest thing I remember is, is oftentimes my dad would come to part of my game. He, he couldn't come to all of it because he was just too busy, but he would come to a few minutes. He would come to a few minutes of my game and then he'd go to another field and he'd go to my brother's game and he'd go to another field and he'd go to their game. And he would just spend a few minutes at part of our baseball game. And, and I remember that a lot of dads weren't present. A lot of my friends that, that were playing ball with me, their dads never came to a game, but I always had the sense that my dad wanted to be at my baseball game. Now, he couldn't always be there, and he couldn't always be at the entire game, but I just knew that my father, my dad, wanted to be there, wanted to be there to support me. And I also know that that's not, that's not everybody's experience of their father. Not everybody had this, this close relationship with the father that I was. Not every kid was blessed with a father who was present in their life and wanted to be there in their life, which, which actually makes the words of St. Paul, I think, even more powerful. St. Paul says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. I mean, that in itself, that text in itself is so key that, that as the Spirit of God, as the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we realize that that we're sons and daughters of God. For those led by the Spirit of God are children of God. That, that I want to be the led by the Spirit of God because I want to be a son of God and, and, I, and I want to have a father. I want to have a father. I think every, the depths of every human heart is honestly to have a father. To have a father that's close to them, a father that cares for them, a father that, that, that comes to their games, wants to come to their games. I mean, I think that's the desire of our heart. And, and St. Paul says, for those led by the Spirit of God, are children of God. But then he says in the next verse, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. He makes this image of, of being a child of God and then first thing he says is, but you didn't receive a spirit of slavery. I mean, think about that image of, of a slave and, and, and what a slave meant. A slave had no rights in and of itself. Um, this relationship between a slave and a master, how would a slave approach his master? He would approach his master out of fear, out of trepidation, uh, anxiety. You know, what's the master gonna feel? Is he gonna, I mean, the slave was always living, and that's what St. Paul says, always living out of fear. But he says, you did not receive that type of a, of a spirit, huh? He goes on to say in the last verse, verse 18, but you received a spirit of adoption through which we cry out, Abba, Father. So that we didn't receive a spirit of slavery that causes us to go before the Lord in some anxiety or fear or nervousness or tension. Rather, we have received a spirit which comes into us and allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. I mean, think about that text. Paul says that we cry out. But to cry out what? You know, that, that's what's so powerful about this text, that, that we receive the Spirit and the Spirit allows us to cry out, Abba. We know that text, it means Daddy, that we cry out, Daddy. I, I love those images. Oftentimes when you see the, an image of a GI coming back from either Iraq or Afghanistan or something like that, and, and the image of, of the little kid running to his father, huh? And there's just this great, for me, they're tear-jerking. I mean, they're really pulling your heartstrings that, that the little guy or the little girl sees her daddy and, and she just runs and she just raises up her hand and she just yells, Daddy! I mean, nobody had to tell her to yell, Daddy. She, she saw her daddy and she just cries out, Daddy! Abba! I mean, that's, that, that's what the Spirit of God wants. The Spirit of God wants to move upon us and He wants and invites us that our heart, our spirit cries out, Daddy. That intimate, sweet relationship that, that we raise our, our hands and we cry out, Abba, Daddy. You know, that this was something that 
This was something only God could reveal to us because I don't think we would ever dare to do it. I mean, you think of, you think of those uh, you know, who are Muslim and they call God Allah, you know, which is master. And in some ways, you know, if you didn't know who God was, if he didn't reveal himself in that way, you would never dare to call him something so intimate and something so personal. I can tell you that, you know, when my kids call me daddy, you know, when they run up and I come home from work, like, it's just music to my ears. You know, it's just the greatest sound ever. And again, I, I think that's music to God's ears, you know, that that's what he wants of us. He's not looking for soldiers or slaves. He's not looking for servants. He's looking for kids who rejoice in his sight and who dance with him and, you know, lift up their arms and just hold him. And, and that's, that's, you know, that's what it's about. You see, that, that was something terribly different with Jesus, that in the Old Testament, there were some references of, of God as Father. So, although that was unique, but when Jesus spoke of God as, as His Father, there was a personalness about that. But Jesus used the word Abba, which had never been used before, that, that nobody used the word Abba. I mean, God was distant. He was far off, even to the Jewish people. There wasn't this, this intimacy that when Jesus speaks of Abba, he speaks of an intimacy that was actually startling for them. That, 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 that was one of the issues that they had with Jesus is, is he spoke of God as Father and, and him as his Son. That, that's terribly different. That's, it's, it's, it's different. That it's one of the uniqueness and one of the beautiful things about being Christian is, is that I call out God as Abba. He is my Father. I had a cool experience that happened one time. I was, I was in the Holy Land and we were walking through Jerusalem and we're in the Muslim quarter of Jerusalem and we were looking at this guy's story. He was obviously Muslim and I was dressed as a Franciscan Catholic priest and we'd just begun to kind of strike up a conversation. It was just really cool because at that time, I honestly, I'd never really met anyone that was Muslim before and uh, we just had this begin this dialogue in this conversation that was just honestly it was just really blessed It was me asking him questions about what he believed and, and me sharing what my experience was of being in the Holy Land And it was just really a neat experience. Well a couple of days later I was walking through the same area and the same gentleman. He, he just kind of hollered out to me He actually he, he waved and he caught my attention and and I re recognized it was the guy that I'd spoken with so I went up and we began kind of where we picked left off we we began talking about faith and God and, and my experiences. And, and I don't know exactly where it happened, but sometime in this conversation, I spoke of God as Father, as Him being my Father. And, and the conversation kind of changed at that point. He said, no, he said, no. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, no, he said, we have many titles for God, but Father is not one of them. God is not Father. It just, it, it occurred to me uh, the blessing and, and, and the beauty and the grace that it is for me to be able to cry out, Abba, that, that God is my Father. That, that, that when Jesus, it radically changes our relationship with God. It's not a relationship between master and servant. Rather, it's a relationship between daddy and daughter. It's a relationship between father and son. It's a relationship about a father who cares for me, a father who knows me, a father who delights in me, a father who allows me to approach him. Just to reflect on that, the way a master or a slave approaches the master compared to the way a child approaches his dad, that, that jumps in his lap and the father rejoices and is glad to see him and, and the father always has time for him and the father delights in her, that, that the spirit comes upon us and, and, and we cry out, Abba. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful image. But the thing is, is, is Paul doesn't just say that. It's interesting when we look at the full text, he says, but you received a spirit of adoption through which we cry out, Abba, Father. I never felt closer to the heart of God the Father than when we adopted our son, Joey. We have seven kids, uh, but one of whom is adopted. Uh, he's from Haiti. And it was something that was really uh, just a profound experience. Uh, after our fifth child, Maria, uh, we felt like we were done and uh, you know Jenny has some health issues that the doctors were like you probably should stop and so we were we were fine to stop and yet we felt in our heart a call to adopt uh, specifically from our blessed mother and I had known some people in Haiti and I knew a seminarian in Haiti 
And really everything was just leading us towards adopting a boy from Haiti. So we just tried to follow the Lord's prompting on that. And it was an amazing experience. We actually um, did all the paperwork and we submitted our paperwork and then the earthquake hit in Haiti. And so we were, you know, watching the television and we were just sobbing and crying, you know, wondering what's going on. And originally we were told to expect it to be two or three years before we'd get Joey from Haiti. And then the earthquake hit and we thought, is it going to be five to six years? Is it even going to happen? No, uh, that's interesting. I found myself thinking about that. Why? Why did Paul say spirit of adoption? Why didn't Paul just say, uh, you've been called, you've received a spirit of, of sonship or a spirit of being a son or daughter that cries out Abba, but he doesn't. He says, you've received a spirit of adoption. And, and I found myself thinking about that and reflecting on that. Well, why a spirit of adoption? I mean, in, in some ways it's like, well, I, do I want to be adopted? I mean, but it's really, it's really actually very, very beautiful and powerful when we think about what Paul was saying when he said that we've received a spirit of adoption. Because in Roman law, uh, for a person to be adopted was very a very intricate process that had many steps and it had great, tremendous legal consequences. Well, first off, if a person was adopted, they, they became a radically new person. The, the name was changed and, and the person was something new. That if the individual being adopted for one reason or another had debts that they owed or money that they owed, they no longer owed those debts. All debts were canceled. That this is a new person. That old person before the adoption is gone. It's, it's, it's no longer. So just this idea that, that an adopted person is, is a new person. The other that the adopted person would claim all of the same rights and privileges of a child who was born of natural birth. So that the same benefits, it didn't matter that one person was adopted, they received exactly the same heritage, the same inheritance, uh, the same blessing, the same, the same gifts. So. But I think the coolest thing, the coolest thing about this spirit of adoption, and it's particularly Paul's writing to the Romans, and, and it's the Roman law. You see, in Roman law, if you had a child, uh, and, and there was something wrong with that child through natural birth, there was something wrong with it, and, and you decided that you didn't want that child, say it was the wrong sex, or, or there was a, some type of a birth defect, no matter what that birth defect was, or ma no matter what the problem was, uh, that you could abandon that child. According to Roman law, you didn't have to keep that child. I mean, in, in one sense, when, when my mom and dad had me, like, they were stuck with me, like it or not, you know, Dave is Dave, you're stuck with him. But that wasn't the case in Roman law. In Roman law, if you had a child and it wasn't exactly what you wanted, you could abandon the child. But that was not the case with adoption. Rather, with adoption, if you adopted a child, you could never abandon that child. The thinking went that you knew what you were getting. The, that when you saw the adopt, when you saw the child that you were going to adopt, it could have been one of many, but when you saw this child, this child, the one that you were going to adopt, you knew what you were getting. You knew the infirmities or you knew the disabilities or you knew what they were coming with so that you were choosing that child knowing about the child. And if you chose that child and if you adopted that child, you could never abandon him. You could never walk away from her. That you were forever united. This child was your son, was your daughter, you were her father, or her mother. Two weeks after the earthquake hit, we got a call from U.S. Immigration saying that they were fast-tracking everybody who had their paperwork in before the adoption. And the other said we were the last people, or we're certainly one of the last people. And uh, three months later, we're in Miami, and my friend who's the seminarian in Haiti is bringing Joey up from Haiti uh, to, to, to be together. And I was a little bit freaked out by how quick everything went. You know, I was expecting it to be two or three years, and I had never actually met Joey. I had one picture of Joey, and we looked at it a lot. But I never touched him, I never talked to him. I didn't know anything about him. I had expected that part of the process of adoption was that we would get to know him. You know, that we would go down to Haiti a few times each year, maybe spend a week with him, and just start building a bit of a rapport, start having relationships so that when we finally take him home, it's not this strangers just you know, bringing him to the home. I mean, it's kind of a little bit better for the child to segue that way. But I was also thinking it's better for me because this kid was about to come off a plane and I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know who he was. He didn't know me from anything. The days leading up 
to picking him up, I had a tough time sleeping. I didn't even want to share this with Jenny because I felt ashamed that I just wasn't sure if I could love him. You know, I, I never chose to love the kids I had biologically. I just did. And I thought to myself, where's that switch? You know, like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? So uh, I still remember the day so well. You know, he, you know, we got up, we went to the airport, the flight was delayed. And as we're waiting, you know, I'm just thinking, God, like, I guess I'll just fake it. You know, I mean, I guess I'll just pretend like I'm excited, you know, and, and still feeling ashamed. And then, um, and then he came out. Um, he came out of the gate and uh, I saw him and that was my son. Like, it was just a move of the heart. It was just this kid I never met and this is my son. You know, and I'm sobbing and Jenny's crying and this kid's like, what's going on? You know, he's totally freaked out by this. And, and it really hit me in that moment, those words of scripture that we're adopted sons and daughters of God. You know, that um, the love of God, you know, I, I just think of, and in, in John he writes, um, you know, see what love the F Heavenly Father has lavished upon us by letting us be called children of God for that's what we are. And just that moment of, you're my son, and no biology, didn't look like me, didn't go through pregnancy, all those other things. It was, uh, I never felt closer to God the Father. Because, you know, there's something with, um, when you have a biological child, there's a sense of responsibility. You know, even if you do it out of wedlock or whatever, you're kind of supposed to take care or you're a deadbeat dad. And, and with adoption, like if we never adopted Joy, nobody would have ever said to us, boy, what's your problem? You know, um, you know, there's a kid in Haiti who you could have in your family. Uh, there's just this level of choice, which again, is just a beautiful level of freedom. You know, that I got to participate with God the Father in adopting Joey and making that choice and realizing that's the choice God the Father made with me you know, when Christ died on the cross and made me a son through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's just the most, one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced. So when Paul says that you have received a spirit of adoption, which cries out, Abba, Father, what he's saying is, is that the Father will never abandon us, that, that he will never walk away from us, that, that he looks at me, he looks at you with, with your weakness and with your fears and with your brokenness and, and with your personality and your quirkiness and your sense of humor and, and your insecurities and all of that. The Father looks upon you and he says, this is my daughter. I delight in her. I, I choose her today as my own. I choose her as my daughter and I will never abandon her. I know everything about him and I will never abandon him. So when Paul says that you have received a spirit which cries out, a spirit of adoption which cries out, Abba, Father, that it is this relationship that, that nothing can break it, nothing can sever this relationship between the Father who is madly and passionately in love with me, madly in love with you, and he looks at you and you are his beloved one. You are his daughter, he is your father. You are his son, he is your daddy and he delights in you, and he rejoices in you, and he celebrates his love for and with you. That those who are led by the Spirit of God do not fall back into a spirit of slavery and fear, rather a spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father. When we were preparing for adoption, we had the opportunity to speak to other parents who had adopted kids. And I said what I thought was a really intelligent thing. I said, I'm gonna love this kid like I love my other kids. And actually it was, it was a mother who said, don't do that. Don't do that because you can love them equally, but it's not the same. There's a special love with adoption because there's a, a more profound choice that's there with adoption. And, um, and it's okay just to embrace the difference of that and really to enjoy the beauty of it. Because, you know, I have six other kids and I would say I love them all differently, equally, but differently. And it's the same thing with Joey, that I love him so much, he's completely my son. And yet there's just a special gift of a grace of adoption that I just appreciate in a deeper way. And when I think of the way the Father loves us, you know, that choice, you know, that the Father made to love me, you know, to love all of us, that he didn't have to make that choice, but he did, that he, he pulled me out of a really 
depressing and dark situation. I had no hope, you know, and Joey didn't have really any hope and, you know, where he was and just brings, brings me into his family, you know, brings me into his home, gives me his name, gives me a place to stay, gives me his love. Um, it, it's just, I mean, I can see now why St. Paul would make that analogy a few times in scripture, you know, because there's, that, that's really what it's about. So here's my suggestion for you, maybe a way to pray and to reflect on this. First off, that fundamental reality, take some time just to be able to be quiet and be able to pray with the reality that you are God's son, you are God's daughter. For some people, they, they've had a wonderful blessing and a wonderful relationship with their father and other people, maybe not. But the reality is God is our father and he wants to make that known to us. This isn't just pie in the sky theology. It's a relationship that God is your father and, and he wants to be your protector and he wants you to know that he notices you and that he sees you and he delights in you. And for those times and experiences where, where maybe you felt empty because your father wasn't there, our God, our Father wants to be there. He wants to be present for you. He wants to be close to you. So take some time and just reflect on that, that, that you have, that we have a Father in heaven, but, but also that I'm a son. And what does that mean for me to be a son? And, and what does that mean for me to be a son who's obedient to his Father, a, a son who wants to be close to his Father, a son who wants to be in relationship with his Father, or, or you are his daughter. So it's, it's God who is Father, and it is I who is Son, you who is daughter. The, because of that, there's this relationship. So take some time just to be able to pray on that reality, that, that we have a Father in heaven, that we are his son or his daughter. Maybe reflect a little bit about this whole image of, of master and, and slave, and, and how do you approach God? Do you approach God confidently that, that he's your Father, that, that the Lord delights in you coming to him? If you're not a pain, you're not, you're not a, a nuisance. You are his son and you are a daughter and he delights in that. So is that how you approach God? Or do we approach God out of fear, out of, well, I don't want to bother you or, or I'm probably, I know I'm in trouble, but, but we're not slaves. We are God's sons. We are God's daughters and he is our father. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you we ask that your Holy Spirit would be upon us, that, that spirit that reveals that, that we are sons and daughters and, and, and that you love us and, and that you are our Father. Jesus, by your power and by your Holy Spirit, free us from a spirit of slavery, that spirit of fear that Paul speaks of, that spirit which binds us, which doesn't allow us to approach the Father, which causes us to approach God out of fear. Free us from that spirit, Lord. And may your Holy Spirit dwell in our hearts, which allows us, which, which causes us to cry out, Abba, Father, you are our daddy. Come with your Holy Spirit. Cry out into our hearts. Draw us closer to a God who is our Father. May Almighty God pour out his blessings upon us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O oh, Spirit, come. 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 Oh, Spirit, come.